Sterling, American Ranger in his great horse arrow. In The Headless Horseman. With Pablo. I think I'm going to be awful scared this week. <laughs> and Panhandle. I ain't a scared of nothing. Uh, nothing alive, that is. The early west of 1850 was a fabulous country where gold could be had for the taking and men could become millionaires overnight. But it was also a lawless country where men lived by the rule of the gun. Against the forces of evil attracted by the easy wealth to be had, the defenders of law and order were almost helpless. The one bulwark standing between the early settlers and the criminal element was a body of men who had dedicated their lives to the war against crime. These courageous men, who daily rode hand in hand with death, were the American Rangers. And of all this group whose noble deeds became a tradition, the most outstanding was Bob Sterling. He could outride, outrope, and outshoot any man west of the Rockies. But his life hung constantly by a hair, for there was no western bad man who had not vowed to kill him at the first opportunity. But Bob Sterling seldom rode alone. His constant companions were fat little Mexican Pablo, as deadly with a knife as most men were with a gun. And weather-beaten old Panhandle, who knew every trick of the gunfighter, including how to beat him to the draw by shooting through his holster. We open our story at Ranger Headquarters. An emergency having arisen, a courier has just brought Bob Sterling in from many miles away. As Bob comes striding in, he finds the ranger captain with a frightened-looking little man wearing a sheriff's badge. Welcome to headquarters, Sterling, Panhandle and Pablo. Sorry to give you such a rough trip, but we're up against one of those cases I feel only you can handle. Well, what's it all about, Captain Hardy? This is Sheriff Jenkins of Laramie County. He'd better tell you himself. The little man with the law badge nervously blinks at Bob through pale blue eyes and then launches into one of the strangest tales to ever come out of the West. What I'm going to tell you will be hard for you men to believe. Well, I'm going to believe it. I believe everything. Except what Panhandle tell about his grandpappy. The sheriff mops at his forehead with a bandana handkerchief. Well, sir, until six months ago, there wasn't a more law-abiding spot in the West than Laramie County, with its gold mines and cattle ranches. It used to be all gold mining until the gold ran out in spots, leaving ghost towns. I've seen some of those ghost towns. I know, believe in ghosts. I think. The little sheriff shudders. Oh, I didn't either until six months ago. And then things began to happen. What kind of things? Awful, horrible things, like you only see in nightmares. He shudders again as though with a chill. Oh. Well, perhaps if you could be a little more definite... Well, first of all, folks started disappearing. Well-known folks, big ranchers and mine owners. They'd be gone for a day or two, maybe a week. Then suddenly they'd be back again, looking pale and scared. And they wouldn't talk, and neither would their families. Then I'd find a body along the road of some man who'd been beaten to death or trampled by horses. And folks who were rich today would be poor tomorrow. But they wouldn't accuse nobody or make a complaint. They just had an awful fear in their eyes. And as soon as they could, they moved away. I started thinking maybe there was something wrong with me. That perhaps I was imagining all this. When one night, I saw him. Oh, what you see? There was a full moon that night. I was walking near the old cemetery when I heard horses coming. Just to be on the safe side... I stepped behind the tree, and then I saw what I never expected to see till my dying day. Four ghosts and filmy white horses. Four ghosts? Oh, my golly goodness. <laughs> and with them was a headless horse. No head? Oh, my golly gracious sake. Oh, he must have had a head. Only it wasn't in the right place. It was a skull, and he was carrying it. Under his arm. I think I go out for a little fresh air. I don't feel so good. Sheriff Jenkins, you don't believe you actually saw ghosts or a man riding around without a head. 
The sheriff mops his brow again. You probably think I'm from that. But how about the fear on the faces of those folks who wouldn't talk? I tell you, the ghost towns, they're giving up their dead. And on moonlight nights, they're riding abroad doing hideous things. Oh, I don't know how we're going to fight dead men. But if we don't stop them in another six months, there won't be a person left in the county. As for me, I ain't never going back. Ghosts on horseback. A headless horseman. Well, that's a new one, Captain. You don't have to tackle this case unless you want to, Stan. Well, I wouldn't miss it. I've always wanted to meet a ghost, and this sure sounds like my chance. How about you, Pablo? I skipped this one, I think. You ain't afraid, are you? Well, I ain't no afraid of regular ghosts. But when he rides around with head under arm... <laughs> but the next day, we find all three crossing the line into Laramie County. Little Pablo seems thoughtful. Hey, Bob, what is ghost? Well, it's supposed to be a spirit, a spook. See, but these spooks, they can talk to each other like we can. Spooks can, Pablo, but they never do. Why? Because they ain't on spooking terms. Oh, he know every bum joke in the world, I think. But Panhandle's fun is cut off abruptly as a black shadow suddenly moves swiftly across their path. Watch yourselves, men. That's a giant eagle climbing. He acts like he's planning to attack. But the eagle moves off and in a moment is forgotten. But only for a moment. For there is a sudden piercing scream from off the road. And the three companions see a sight that chills the marrow in their bones. In the yard of a little ranch house, a young mother is screaming hysterically at the huge eagle which has swooped down on her baby's crib. Bob shouts a warning, but even as he does, the eagle grasps the baby in its powerful talons and zooms into the air with it, the mother's voice rising in a cry of agony. Mommy! My baby, help! Help! Oh, that's finished for poor little baby. There's still a slim chance. Shoot quick, Panhandle, before he gains altitude. Just don't hit the baby. As though conscious of the threat below, the eagle is exerting all the strength in its powerful wings as it starts to climb through the air. Panhandle not only has to make the shot from the back of his galloping horse, but unless his aim is absolutely true, the baby, not the eagle, will die. The frantic mother screams again. Oh, don't shoot! Don't shoot, Marty! You'll be killed! The Panhandle is already pulling the trigger. There is a sharp crack as his bullet splits the air, and then the huge bird spins about. Its great claws open, and there is nothing but thin air between the falling infant and the ground below. But wait! There's still one meager chance. As the distraught mother, Pablo and Panhandle, watch with a prayer on their lips, Bob races toward the spot where the baby is plummeting down. Should Harold stumble or Bob make the slightest miscalculation, the child will be dashed to pieces. But as the little falling body is a mere ten feet from the ground, the great white stallion races under it, Bob stands high in his stirrup, and like a center fielder catching a ball, his powerful hand snaps the child out of the air and back from eternity. A moment later, he is placing it in the arms of his hysterical mother. Oh, he's alive. You saved him. Oh, my baby. Oh, it was nothing, ma'am. Just a little good teamwork. How can I thank you? Who are you? What are your names? Oh, we don't want any thanks, ma'am. But if anyone should ask you, just, just say it was Pablo, Panhandle, and Bob Sterling doing their good deed for the day. But now, let's hasten to Little Rock, the county seat where the three companions are headed. The prettiest girl in town is Mona Matthews, only daughter of Cyrus Matthews, editor of the Laramie Weekly Gazette. At the moment, the little town is agog, for Mona has jilted her childhood sweetheart, young Dick Lane, acting sheriff in the absence of Sheriff Jenkins, and is going to marry Brett Barton, the young, handsome head of Little Rock's only bank, who arrived in town not more than three months before. Old Mr. Matthews has Mona in his office, taking her to task over the news. But why? Why, Mona? Why are you throwing over a nice, clean-cut Western boy to marry that, 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 that stuff shirt from the East? Well, I thought I loved Dick until Brett came to town, Dad. But when I'm married, I want to be somebody. But Dick Brain comes from good stock. He's our kind. He may be only acting sheriff now, but if Jenkins don't come back, he'll be the sheriff. Unless I miss my guess, you'll be the town's next mayor. Well, someday you'll be glad I'm marrying Brett. 
Why, they say Brett will soon be the biggest landowner in the county. Yeah, if there's any county left. Yes, it goes on around here. Half our best citizens have moved away. Well, if Dick is so smart, why hasn't he found out what's driving people out of the county? He's working on it, and he'll solve it. Why, he's worth ten of that Brett Barton any day. Oh, you're just prejudiced, Dad. But you'll change your mind when I'm the wife of the richest young banker in the state. At this moment, Bob, Pablo, and Panhandle are reining up in front of the sheriff's office across the street. Hurrying in, they introduce themselves to the blonde young man who rises to greet them. He looks so boyish, they're not inclined to take him seriously at first. But before he's talked for more than a moment, they are eyeing him with a newfound respect. Well, you see, gentlemen, as everyone's too frightened to talk, I decided to find out a few things for myself. You mean you've turned up something already? Plenty. I decided to do a little night prowling, and the very first night I stumbled on their meeting place. Whose meeting place? Why, the meeting place of the ghosts. Oh, <laughs> they really are ghosts? Well, they sure look like it. They're dressed in sheets from head to foot, and the man who's evidently the leader is just as Sheriff Jenkins described him. You mean no head? Apparently not, except for the skull he carries. Mm, I'm not going to like this cage. His not having a head must be some trick, some optical illusion. Ah, uh, sure, hope so. Uh, what happened then, son? Well, I, I couldn't tackle them alone, so I did the next best thing. I put on an outfit just like theirs, and the next night I hid at that same spot. When they showed up, I mixed in with them. Well, that took nerve. <laughs> but don't think I wasn't scared. However, I looked just like the rest of them, and no one noticed me. And you went along with them? And got enough on them to hang them, when I can find out who they are. He tells what happened that night. A horrifying tale of night riders and intimidation never before known in the annals of the West. Men dragged from their beds by hooded figures and lashed unmercifully in the dead of night. Oh. Honest citizens beaten with huge clubs or throttled into insensibility. Men tied to the pummel of a saddle and dragged by ghostly riders over rough ground until the spark of life was almost extinct in their battered bodies. And even a wife and daughter tied together and cruelly whipped in the presence of their menfolk. No. This is unbelievable in a civilized community. What was said to these people? Well, that's the strangest part of it. Not a word was spoken, even to those who were taken away. Taken away? Where to? Uh, I couldn't follow them without arousing suspicion. Well, those must be the ones Sheriff Jenkins mentioned who disappeared. They're probably taken to the ghost headquarters and held for ransom. And the others are just being scared out of the county for some reason. Well, what do we do about all this, Mom? Uh, we'll have to wait until they gather again and then trail them. When we locate their hideout, we'll organize a pot in and round them up. Meanwhile, we'd better find a hotel. <laughs> There's only one, and I'm afraid it isn't much. I'll take you over there now. As they start out, they almost collide with Brett Barton and Mona. Dick has no choice but to introduce them all. Imagine, Brett. This is the famous Bob Sterling. I hope you'll be able to clear up this mystery that's driving some of our best families out of the county, Sterling. Not good for the banking business, you know. Well, we'll sure help the young sheriff here all we can. Good. And if there's any way that I can help, don't hesitate to call us. Mona sees the unhappiness written on Dick's face, and for a moment there is a little catch in her throat. But then the picture rises before her of her future life as the wealthy young banker's wife. And clutching Brett's arm, she continues down the street. Pablo, you're awful dumb when you're introduced to folks. Huh? Why didn't you say something when Dick introduced you to that pretty girl? Well, I don't want her to think I'm loco. What do you mean? Oh, uh, she's so pretty. All I'd be able to say is, hoo hoo Dick leaves them at the hotel, promising to pick them up at midnight and show them the meeting place of the ghosts. But Bob's presence in town has apparently not been unobserved. For as the three are sitting in their rooms that evening, Panhandle sees a white hooded head with two staring eyes disappearing beneath the windowsill. Bob! One of them ghost critters is speaking through the window! Oh, you're imagining things, Panhandle. They don't even know we're in town yet. Pablo, sitting by the other window, starts to grin. Mm, brave old Panhandle getting scared, I think. <laughs> But Pablo's grin fades and his hair goes straight up. For just outside his window, another voice says, 
Bob and Panhandle turn to look, then break into a chuckle. <laughs> or on the limb of a tree just behind Pablo is a hoot owl. As their attention is thus diverted for a moment, a ghostly figure rises outside the other window and hurls a wicked-looking knife that only misses Bob's throat by a hair. Bob jumps up and fires through the window. But the ghost is gone. Dick picks them up, and they watch until almost morning, but no ghosts appear. And the same thing happens the next night, and the night after. They've evidently decided to lay low until we give up and leave town. Dick's face falls. Oh, if I could have rounded them up and been the county hero for it, Mona might have changed her mind about marrying Brett tomorrow. She won't now. Oh, I guess I've lost her for good. Well, maybe not, son. I've been doing a little detective work, and I might still be able to help you before it's too late. But it looks as though Bob is just trying to cheer the unhappy boy a little. For high noon of the following day finds Brent and Mona standing before a clergyman in Little Rock's swankiest church with the marriage ceremony well on the way. If anyone knows of any reason why this couple should not be joined in the holy bonds of matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. There is a moment of hushed silence. Then Bob Sterling suddenly stands, his voice booming through the church. I know a mighty good reason, Parson. That man is a criminal and a murderer, a member of the ghost gang. For a second, no one moves. And then Bedlam breaks loose. Why? 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 Who sees Cyrus Matthews and the minister and drag them along, shooting as they go. By the time Bob can struggle to his feet, the galloping hoops of their horses have faded into the distance. And although the frantic Dick organizes a posse who comb the countryside, they can find no trace. By midnight, Bob, Pablo, and Panhandle, their horses completely spent, give up the search, and ride dejectedly back into town. If I had taken you men to the church with me, this never would have happened. It was a last-minute hunch, and I had to act fast. Uh, how do you know Brett Barton belonged to Ghost King? Well, it was just a wild guess, Pablo. I learned he'd been buying up all the property folks were being scared into selling for almost nothing. It seemed to tie in. I wonder why the gang took the gal's dad and the preacher along with them. But to force Mona to go through with the wedding regardless. Well, all we can do now is to get some sleep. We can't do any more tonight. What if Bob was through for the night? The ghost men weren't. At that moment, one raises up from behind a rock and lets go with a rifle, which luckily only takes Bob's hat from his head. By the time they can reach the rock, he has slithered away into the darkness. And an hour later, as Bob is just dropping off to sleep, there is a stealthy knock on his door. A moment later, a very frightened man is sitting by his bedside. This will probably cost me my life, Sterling, but I had to warn you. The ghosts are planning to raid the town tomorrow and kill you and everybody who gets in their way. How do you know this? Well, I'm a, I'm a member of the ghost gang myself. Your only chance is to get your party together again tonight and raid ghost headquarters before morning. I, I'll tell you how to get there. But I don't understand. Why are you doing this for me? For well, what you did for my missus and me. I'm the father of that boy you saved from the eagle just inside the county line. I couldn't let you get killed after that. An hour later, the posse is galloping toward a forgotten ghost town hidden away in the hills. Inside its reconstructed jail, tragedy is afoot. At dawn, Brett Barton is coming for his answer from Mona. Unless she marries him then, her father will meet death before her eyes. Mona has sworn defiance, but she knows she will yield to save her father's life. As she sits in her cell, her one thought is of Dick Lane, whom her heart now tells her is the man she really loves. As dawn approaches, she slips to her knees in silent prayer. Little realizing that at that very moment, four pair of eyes are peering down from a rocky ledge looking at the ghost town below. If we attack in force, they'll either kill Mona and her father or spare them away again through some underground passage. Our only chance is to sneak in singly and take them by surprise. Suddenly a bonfire flares, and in the light they see the headless horsemen apparently give orders to a group of hooded figures who fade quickly back into the night. A hooded figure gallops up, the headless figure points, and the figure gallops away again. Those hooded figures are going into the old city hall building where the jail is. You and your men surround it while Panhandle, Pablo, and I scout around a bit and see if they've laid any ambush. They may have gotten word somewhere of our coming. As Dick scurries off to give the orders to the waiting posse, the other three separate and creep stealthily down to the level below. 
As little Pablo steps out from behind a tree, he comes face to face with the headless figure itself. Please, you. Uh, excuse, please. I got previous appointments, I think. <laughs> And before the figure can reach for him, he's running as no little fat man ever ran before. Meanwhile, Panhandle has slipped into the first building he came to. He is proceeding cautiously past some old velvet drapes when three ghostly hands reach out and grab him. With a wild yell, he's out of the building, for brave as he is, fighting spooks isn't in his category. Meanwhile, ghost men have appeared in the windows of the old city hall and seeing the posse creep up of open fire. <coughs> but Dick leads his men into a sudden <coughs> surprise assault. They crash through the front door and, in a moment, are engaged in a fierce hand-to-hand battle with the ghost-like figures who, for a moment, seem to be getting the better of them. Then Bob, Pablo, and Panhandle come tearing in, and the tide of the battle turns. The white-sheeted figures that are now strewn about the floor, turning and fleeing for their lives, only to be captured by the reserve posse, which Dick had left stationed outside for that very purpose. Panhandle. You and Pablo helped Dick break into the jail through the rear. I'm sure you'll find Mona, Mr. Matthews, and the parson there. Aren't you coming with us, Bob? Well, my job isn't finished yet. I'm still missing the man I came after, that headless horseman. I'm not going back without him. I'm starting with the cellar. That's where rats can usually be found. And even as he speaks, the weird figure he is seeking is creeping cautiously across the cellar below, headed for the rear door and escape. He's almost reached it when the door opens and Bob steps in, gun in hand. Firing a quick shot at him, the headless figure turns and dashes up the stairs with Bob in close pursuit. As he reaches the first floor, the ghostly figure is just reaching the second landing. As he turns, Bob fires, and the figure dashes up another flight of the stairs, Bob still after him. As the headless one reaches the top, he turns, aims his gun directly at Bob's heart, and pulls the trigger. But there's only a click. His ammunition is exhausted. Bob bounds up the steps and has him cornered in the attic just under the railed-in cupola. Now that your gun is empty, I won't be needing mine. I like to wreck rattlesnakes with my bare fist. As Bob tosses his gun to the floor, the hooded figure scrambles up the ladder to the railed-in cupola. But Bob is right after him. Now, you sidewinder, I'm going to see the murderous face you've been hiding under that sheet. But as Bob reaches for him with his powerful arms, the headless figure lunges with his now empty pistol. His unexpected rush forces Bob's body against the ancient cupola ran- railing. There is a cracking splitting of wood, and the railing gives away. But just as it does, Bob turns with a cat-like spring and delivers a crushing right. There is a gasp, a terrified cry. Ah! The white-sheeted body crashes through the broken railing and goes hurtling to the ground. Five minutes later, a little group is gathered around the white-robed figure lying below. As Bob pulls down the false shoulders and neck that gave the impression of the head being missing, Mona emits a shocked scream. Ah! For the face that is revealed is the face of Brett Barton. The following week, there is another wedding, but this time a much happier one, with not one best man, but three. Perhaps not too comfortable, but certainly dressed in the height of fashion. The following day, having shed their store clothes and said goodbye, we find Bob, Pablo, and Panhandle once again on the broad prairie where they feel so much at home. Pablo is cooking something over a campfire, his face smeared with heavy grease. What's that all over your face, Pablo? Oh, that grease. I cooking now from cookbook, and that's what cookbook say to do. The cookbook says to put grease on your face. Hmm? Where in tarnation does it say that? Right here. It says, before cooking, always grease the pan. (laughs) 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 And so ends the adventure of Bob Sterling and the Headless Horseman. This telecast was produced by Eugene Conrad and directed by Charles C. Barrows.